Okay, so our presentation today is uh, engaging teaching strategies uh, for issues-based topics. And this is something that Denise and I really love working with our students on. This was a presentation uh, that we gave to the faculty for the College of Ag and Applied Sciences last fall um, at our faculty college uh, faculty meeting. And this is something that we've given a couple of times, but we continue to see that it's relevant in a bunch of different fields. We're going to give you the top 10 today. Some of those will um, we'll give a little bit more detail than others, but this is a simplified version of what we do in our classrooms to make sure that we have a lot of engagement. Students understanding um, in the presentation I was just in, talking specifically about teach, uh, scholarly teaching and learning. And these are ways that our students really um, embody and embrace the information that we want to share with them. It also gives them opportunities to have their own personal opinions and to stretch those opinions and push the limitations of maybe what they've heard in the past, uh, relevant with current facts, current information, and maybe some even different philosophies of life. Uh, sometimes that's not always a safe area in the classroom, and sometimes they don't feel like it's safe, even though you may feel like it's safe. And so we've put together some of these strategies to make sure that happens. This is my um, Denise, and we're just going to go back and forth, oh, right? We're, we're, Are we yeah. ready? Okay. Like tennis. Um, critical thinking. Do you want to address this quote? Well, this, so this is Linda Elder, who is from the uh, Institute of Critical Thinking. I think it's out of California. Um, but she talks about the fact that we have to develop these fair-minded societies. And I, she, um, I got an email, because I'm on their mailing list, um, earlier this summer. And she talked about the fact that, sadly, um, she finds that a lot of our students, even down at elementary education levels, are not um, empowered to um, critically think, make decisions and problem solve, or even to challenge others' thoughts. And I, to me, that was very um, interesting as a teacher that even at, at lower age levels, these students, they, they feel like you know, it's, it's wrong to challenge someone's thinking. And she said, you have to. And, and there are ways to do that well and, and intelligently and tactfully. But um, I just found that very, very intriguing that she said we need to start at lower age levels and move through so that students feel empowered and they have a skill set that they can challenge conventional wisdom. And so hopefully some of these st strategies that we'll share with you um, will show you some ways that students can do that, as Rose said, in a safe context. Whoops. Sorry. Our first one is what um, we call the Socratic method. There are a couple of different types of Socratic method, and one that Denise uses is a little bit different than the one that I use in class. But basically, the Socratic method is, rather than being the sage on the stage, we're going to move to the guide on the side kind of a mode of thinking, uh, especially in lecture-type formats. And the Socratic method, it, we use that, use questions to examine the values, principles, beliefs of students, and use different methods of introducing questions and pushing them with questions in Socratic formats so that they have to answer the questions as a group and then create other questions for students to answer. And there are, um, like I say, there's some really sophisticated formats with the Socratic method. Um, I, so Denise I, uses this. I use what's called the about. Harkness method. It's a, a modified Socratic method, and I used it um, for a several semesters for actually providing my midterm and final exams. And so students were in a group. Um, I, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but they were, we, I asked questions of them as a group, as a whole. Um, then I drew out names on popsicle sticks, and they had to answer that question. And then I had to a ask another question based on that student's answer of another person. It was harder for me than it was for my students. It made me a nervous wreck <laughs> because it took so much structure. But students loved it. The evaluation said, I've never had a better testing method ever. I'm not sure how educationally sound it is. I'm sure I needed, I know I need to tweak it and make it better. I'd love to talk to you more about that if you have interest in that. But I used it for those midterm and final exams, and student evaluations were very, very positive. Yeah. Socratic method is a good way to get students comfortable with asking the right types of questions. And there are several places online I just want to mention. Uh, Students don't know how to set up a good question, especially a probing question that doesn't involve a yes or a no answer. So 
spending a little bit of time even just giving them outlines of here are 10 types of questions. Memorize five. Memorize five of these types of questions and ways to ask them in class and it will really increase the amount of dialogue that you get. This rolls into a decision matrix where when you give a student a scenario where they have to be able to make a decision about a particular um, issue based topic. Even if that's climate change, uh, it could be something political, it could be something along the lines of science and scientific understanding. Although science is facts, it is not alternative <laughs> facts, we do have to have an understanding of how those facts apply to people and the issues that are in their lives. Denise and I both use a decision matrix, which is really a simple sheet of paper, very similar to this, that has pros on one side and cons on the other. So when we represent an issue in class, we have them utilize a decision matrix right there, right in front of them. So as they're listening, they're creating down notes of their personal perceptions of how they're thinking about the lecture or how they're thinking about the information, how they may be even interpreting that information as a pro or a con. And then often we use small groups to get them together where they have to come together and make a decision about the issue. Um, the choices that are available, really simplistic. But um, using this as something where they have to turn this in or even as an exit, you know, like exit attendance kind of a thing where they turn that in even individually or in a group, gives you a good idea of where people are standing on the issues and what questions remain. I use this with the, um, my food literacy class. I had students read, I uh, put them in different groups and each group read a different article on the new SNAP proposal. So those of you who are NDFS food folks, you know the changes we're having to SNAP. Um, and they read those articles and then they, they filled out the decision matrix on their own after reading an article. We had a class discussion, then they had small group discussions, then they had to make a choice. They had to make a decision, should the SNAP um, program be um, changed as proposed by the, the new administration? And it was a pretty interesting exercise in terms of what the students um, were able to gain from that. Along with the decision matrix, number eight is a really also another way to kind of interpret uh, issues and how students are understanding an issue. I love the futures wheel. Denise and I use a very similar futures wheel, but a lot of times we use it in different ways, which is why this is so awesome because it lends itself to giving you different outcomes based on the type of class or the type of dialogue that you're seeking within your class. Enable students to analyze, predict, and speculate. I use this as predictive analytics. Because I'm teaching science, I'm letting students know when you go to a city council meeting or a community council meeting, a lot of times they're going to throw out a futures wheel to try to determine what are the long-term impacts and how are those impacts going to Im affect real people in real situations. And so we put a critical issue, the trend or event, in the center, and then it literally becomes an if-then kind of a situation. If this happens, it could be something in terms of environmental. Utah State University gets rid of plastic straws. Plastic straws are in the it's news lately, right? It's a big lately, thing on the right? news, yeah. That's a big so thing. they get rid of straws. You can't get a plastic straw on campus. What's the very next thing that's going to happen, right? The statesman, you know, the university paper, going to write an article. <laughs> you can guarantee somebody's going to write an article about it in the states, right? So really basic first-order consequences, which lead to second- and third-order consequences. Um, those rationales allow them to take it um, out to see what the long-term effects are. And Denise goes one step further. Yeah, I think it was. So after they have all these consequences, first, second, third, order consequences, and they, they can, they're just brainstorm, right? Mm -hmm. No idea is, is um, negated. And so then I, I have them look at that, and I have them identify, are those consequences positive or negative? If it's, if it's a negative impact, how might we minimize that negative impact? Then they have to analyze the positive impact, which is a little more difficult. If it's positive, how do we maximize that positive impact? And so it makes them think a little bit. It's like weighing risk and consequence. It's risk assessment, basically. And so how do you minimize negatives and maximize positives? Yeah. I do actually put a limitation because I always tell my students, if, it, if your third order consequence says apocalypse or Jesus comes again, it's a zero. <laughs> my students usually say Walmart. I learned that the hard way. My, my students usually say Walmart rules the world. Somehow it ends up that way a lot but, of times. But yeah. that's okay. I did have to put some limitations on the, the, the amount of consequence that happens at the third order. 
But critical thinking skills are really what we want to get to. There was such a great question in my last session, and a guy said, you know, when we're measuring student assessment and student outcomes, it is so critical thinking is one of those things where you're like, wow, are they really critical, critically thinking? Can we really determine that they are, you know, doing this at the level we want them to do? But there are a few things that I have learned that have really helped me to get some insight. And a lot of times I start with just vocabulary. Vocabulary, the, there is a certain vernacular that goes along with critical thinking. And for students to be able to use those correct words is really important. Two, I think, and this is the gospel according to me, <laughs> of the most important um, concepts for them to understand are the differences between an egocentric perspective and a sociocentric perspective. Egocentric perspective, it's true because I believe it. It's true because I want to believe it. It's true because I've always believed it. I've never known anything different. Sociocentric perspectives and critical thinking are state of being culture bound, placing one's particular culture, nation, ethnicity, religion above any others. And for them to be able to identify that and put it in certain categories is empowering because they can't put themselves in those places and they can't actually define what their specific biases are until they can say, wow, I'm saying it's true because I've always believed it's true and now I know that has a term, that's egocentric. And so it's really empowering to them and I've seen that really change the way that they think and the way that they write responses, even in online discussion posts, for them to have that vernacular. I also use this, this is also from um, criticalthinking.org from the elders, yes, Linda, Linda and Paul, Linda isn't it Elder. Paul? Paul and Linda Paul Elder. and Linda Elder. Anyway, they have three orders of thinking. And we talk a lot about what it means to, you know, have a gut feeling, you know. There are times and places when a gut feeling, you should probably go with that. <laughs> but there are also times when you should not. And we talk a lot about that that's, it is still thinking. It is still processing. It doesn't mean that you've checked out. But if you're just going with your first gut reaction and you're believing it because it's true, that might be a lower level of thinking. We also talk a lot about what fairness means in critical thinking. That's another word that in regular life, we talk about fairness being that everybody gets a cookie. But critically thinking about fairness means that everybody gets an opportunity to be heard. Everybody gets an opportunity to be uh, on an equitable playing field. So just having an understanding of those terms <laughs> makes a big difference. I've got a little video clip here. This is just one. I have found that the quickest way to get their attention with critical thinking and in tying that to specific words and beliefs is to give them YouTube video examples. <laughs> and I kid you not, type in egocentric <laughs> people on YouTube and you will find amazing things. Some not, not so good to play in your class, but this one is. Elizabeth Sullivan has lived in the same Fort Worth, Texas house since 1942. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks for inviting us to your home. <laughs> I'm glad for you to come in. And she has just celebrated her 104th birthday, as the big balloons in her living room make clear. You had your driver's license until last January? That's until right. you were 103? I was driving everywhere. You That's were? Yeah, I was going to church. I was going to the woman's club. I was playing bridge. I was doing everything. She credits at least some of her longevity to a Lone Star State favorite. Now you're drinking Dr. Pepper right now. That's exactly why right. Do, why that, do you, that stuff is good. It's got sugar in it. And three, two doctors have told me that if I drink it, I will die. But they died first. <laughs> okay, so that's proof that it's good for you. Yeah. So you, yeah. Think, you, you think that this drink is, has helped you live to these, this age of 104? Well, evidently, because... Uh, everybody tells me it has too much sugar in it, but since I've been drinking three a day for 50 or 60 years, uh, evidently my body needs sugar. I don't take any medication. They can't still find anything wrong with me. 
<laughs> classic case of anecdotal evidence. <laughs> but it's true because I believed it's true, right? Two doctors told me that if I drink it, I will die. But I outlived them both, right? So this woman obviously has some solid egocentric <coughs> perspective, really good things, um, easy ways to get your students thinking about. She's got 104 years of science. Does I? Mean? <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but that's a really good way to think about it. That's a longitudinal study right there. <laughs> uh, social media positions is another one. Um, identifying bias by examining uh, comments. Uh, this is just a particular one from my student, this particular quote. Many of the comments reflected by using some of those debate techniques, that's another terms that I want them to understand, red herring, strawing, straw man, red herring, um, some of those techniques they can understand how people try to win arguments without real facts or without real information. And a lot of times that, you know, why we get heated and why we lose our cool really quick is because we're not actually defending the issue. We start to have to defend ourselves or other people. And so being able to understand that bias is really important. I know that some professors are really turned off by social media. I am not turned off by social media. I think it's something that the students relate to and understand, even if they don't use it or don't like it, they still understand that that's a, that is a critical path of communication in, our, in modern day society. So getting them into Twitter to look for bias, getting them to look for red herring comments and to identify straw man, it's incredibly empowering for them to be able to say, I recognize that now. All of a sudden, you know, he was talking about this particular issue, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm defending Obama, right? So some of those things really, it's a, they're able to pull and comprehend some of those things. I was say, just by reading the comments, when you, get, you, know, you look at a, a post and you read the comments, you're doing a decision, make, a decision matrix in your head right there, right? Yeah. You read a comment and go, oh, yeah, that's, I believe that. And you read the next one. Oh, maybe I don't believe it. And so literally, you're re sifting through those comments in social media and looking at the pros and cons and doing some critical thinking and, and uh, really some independent thinking, hopefully, and looking yeah. at what biases you might have that, yeah. that are there. It can be really fun for them to do screenshots of particular comments and highlight. I have them highlight uh, <coughs> screenshot comments and then highlight where there are holes in their argument, where bias exists in the, envir or in the argument, where facts exist in the argument, where they try to, if anyone tries to back up an argument, is that actually a fact or is that just simply opinion? Uh, those kinds of things are, are good for students to have to do. Do you want to talk about concept maps? Yeah, I use concept maps and infographics to help students synthesize information. This was our final exam, actually, last semester, and it worked quite well. I've used it for several years, and I've, I'm using student feedback and student evaluation about the process. They're really involved in the process of this. So they have to research um, a topic in uh, food literacy. They have to pick their own topic, and then we have them do concept maps, so brainstorming, mind mapping. And they get together in small groups, and they, they, they brainstorm all the factors and inputs um, that are part of a certain topic. And then they take that concept map, and they synthesize that into an infographic. And I tell them they need to have about three key points. And that's, that's really some, some good problem solving and, and thinking in terms of how do you take all this information that you brainstorm and synthesize it into a piece of information that someone will probably spend seven to ten seconds reading. And students, I think, have really enjoyed this. They, they are not artists. I don't teach them how to do um, the software. Rose has some good um, tutorials that I, I made, borrow yeah. from her. I did. I made, I made video tutorials of how to use two particular programs. One was PictoChart to create the infographics, and the other was LucidChart, which they actually pay for as a part yeah. of their student fees. Right with their Aggie Mail account, and I just made very simplistic tutorials in Camtasia, uh, including some, this morning I realized I did my plus one because I <laughs> added the text, so woo! And uh, yeah, really, really solid feedback. Yeah. They, they enjoy that because they feel like I, I can do this, I, I can watch the tutorial and then I go through the steps. I have them do at se separate times. They have to make their concept map first mm -hmm. and then based on the information that they created in their concept map, then they create an infographic afterward. I'll also note that last summer, in the middle of the summer, I got a random text from a former student who had taken my class spring semester. And she said, Professor Murray, I just want you to know that 
I went to my first job. I met my first, I graduated, I met my very first job, and she said, my first solo assignment, they had given me a topic, and they said, we need you to go in and create an infographic for publication, and she said, I was able to stand up and say, I can do that. <laughs> so she said, I actually went back and logged into Canvas again and looked up your tutorial and went back to PictoChart to create my very first project. She said it was a huge success, and that this was a life skill, that this was something that she knew how to do this, she knew how to work with the software. Infographics are something that we use all the time. This, I actually think of this as a student skill, as one of those skills they need to, at some point, have created something digitally, whether they're in business or music or something, they need to understand at the most basic level how to create an infographic and communicate information in that seven seconds. Mm -hmm. So I do use Lucidchart, like I said, it's just in their Google, in their Gmail account for ag email, and then PictoChart is free. That's also something Denise and I work really hard to do is to make sure that they don't have to purchase additional oh, yeah. software. That's, we, we're, we don't do that. So these are free programs that they can utilize and access and can give them some real, real world experience. Okay, I can't take credit for ESPN. This is something Denise <laughs> well, brought to me. I can't take credit for it because I stole it, borrowed it too. <laughs> so I was at um, a human geography, the AP Human Geography Conference a couple of years ago, their national conference, and I heard some speakers um, talking about using this ESPN con uh, concept. They talk about uh, impacts with their students. So they, they use this um, acronym, ESPN, not the sports network, but economic, social, political, and environmental impacts. And in teaching a class like I do, on food literacy, every topic that we have, I say, think about what are the economic, social, political, and environmental impacts of decisions that are being made. And I had a student come to me, he was working on that concept map infographic uh, um, assignment that he had to do, and he said, I had this concept map, and he said, I, I, can't, I can't pare it down to what you want for an infographic. And I said, think about the ESPN concept. And he's like, oh, that economic, social, political, and environmental impacts, that's what I should be looking at? And I said, yes. He's like, I can do that. And so I use this all the time. I talk about ESPN. We're talking about climate change or bioengineered foods or environmental sustainability or the SNAP program proposals. I say, what are the ESPN impacts? And they, it's just a nice way for them to help categorize and synthesize some of that information. So it's been really a, a powerful tool. Those, that little tiny acronym is something that I have used over and over again. Yeah. If you're in the sciences, I always try to differentiate between there's the actual science, there's the knowledge that we have. We have this understanding, we have the measurements, the observations and the calculations, but we also have the issues and how to respond, and they're two totally different things. A lot of times ESPN helps my students because they see the science as maybe questionable, when in reality the facts are the facts. The challenge is, is what is the human response going to be? And so to be able to say, here are the facts as we know them, and then we can say there's going to be the ESPN on the issue side and how that's all going to come together. And that's going to make a big difference in helping those students analyze, wow, it really isn't the science that we have a problem with. It's really coming to a decision as a human society. And so. I, put, you know, I put ESPN on big... Um, poster sheets around the, the room and give them sticky note pads yeah. and they'll talk about something and I say if you come up with an impact so then they can write down on the sticky note and put it on the posters and we share those and, and they get to think about other people's points of view. It's a, a nice tactile way to do that. Yeah. About 10 minutes right? Okay. Annotated text and note taking. Okay, this is like the part where everyone like, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Denise and I have both been teaching connections for a while and have taught different introductory courses. We both recognize that students really struggle with annotated text and note taking. Um, when we talk about critical issues, a lot of the stuff that we give to students are articles, whether that's a journal article for grad students or whether it's a, a sophisticated text or whether it's just simply a book. I use a lot of book chapters from a variety of different books. I notice Anne out there. Woo woo, shout out to my library friends. So I use a lot of different course reserve texts um, that students have to read and, and analyze. And at the beginning of the semester, it's worth its weight in gold to take 15 minutes and talk about. Um, these are some videos that are available on the usu.edu website. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those 
um, orientation videos just simply about how do I annotate a text correctly? How do I take notes effectively in class? How would I highlight and, and um, look at specific principles of ideas, right? And how do I identify where maybe that's, I would highlight that maybe that's something that conflicts with my personal beliefs or my personal perspectives, whether or that's something that I agree with, and how to take that and use that in solid ways in the class in order to develop those questions and those questioning methods that we talked about at the very beginning. The Academic Success Center here at Utah State University has, if you just, you can go on the USC website and just type in Academic Success Center, and they have a lot of information on note taking and uh, text annotation. I, I force my connection students to do that, and I make them use the Cornell Notes method um, for an assignment, and I, I do force them to do that and say, try this. If you have a better way that works for you after you try it, that's great. A lot of them say, oh, I already do this. Right? I know how to do this. And then we have them develop questions. And then we give, I give them a quiz on the information that they just read and say, okay, how did you do on the quiz using your notes and your annotated uh, text? How did you do? And it's a good way to, to help them think about uh, maybe ways to in, improve their skills on what it seems. I mean, we've done this for years. I've been in school forever. But I think it's a really good skill to help them practice. Online discussions, just really briefly, online discussions, you either love them or you hate them. That's kind of how I feel about <laughs> online discussions. I've had a lot of success with online discussions, and a lot of the successes that I've had have been through taking advice from these ETE workshops. Uh, last year, I implemented for my fall and spring semester uh, some information that I got from Courtney Stewart and Travis Thurston. It's all videoed. It's on the ETE website if you want to watch it about using power-ups and oh, hashtags yes, yes. in their, in my online discussions. And it took my online discussions from good to very good. I'm still working to get to a five-star level mm -hmm. in online discussions, but it made a huge difference to have the students think about how they were thinking using the power-ups and using hashtags in, um, to identify whether they were analyzing information or remembering information or connecting information, creating new information. Uh, some of those things are really important to add some elements to your online discussions. I've also noticed that rotating small groups has been very successful for me. I'll leave it at that. Uh, it's something that, that I've used and that I have had great success as in these issue-based topics conversations. Oh. Okay, our last one um, oh, yeah. is something <laughs> that Denise <laughs> shared with me and that my students love. And some people are like, well, you know, you're science and that just seems really ridiculous. Well, I don't really care because <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyway. I love Reader's <laughs> Theater and I love how it takes the icy edge off particular conversations. I can teach all semester. I can teach GMOs, I can teach genetic engineering, cloning, even like getting into the nitty gritty of assisted suicide and looking at some of those really heavy topics in modern society. And on day one of we're gonna talk about climate change, it's like hell freezes over in there. And it's so icy and people shut down and they don't wanna talk about it because it really rattles their personal beliefs and some of their political beliefs to have to talk about the science of climate change. And this seems to be a fantastic icebreaker for me. Uh, Reader's Theater, uh, conflict resolution, understanding how people think and how we talk to each other, how we dialogue, the differences between discussion and dialogue can be significant. And having a conversation like this is one of the ways that I introduce it. You want to tell what it is? So yes. Yeah, so um, speaking about climate change, yeah. How do we introduce that? So a graduate student, former graduate student here at Utah State University, Sebastian Lowe, um, posted an issue or a, a, a information on Facebook last year um, because he's a climate scientist. He wrote this kind of tongue in cheek about climate science and the discussions that go on about this topic. When I saw it on Facebook, I asked his permission to adapt it to a reader's theater for my class. I was big of that in high school. And he said, absolutely, go ahead and use it. So gentlemen, I need you up here for just a second. We're not going to do it. We don't have time. But just to hold these. So what Sebastian did was he wrote this, just face the audience there. He wrote this um, reader's theater about climate change. And I have the whole script. So I adapted his Facebook writing into a script.
um, specifically for some other elements of my classroom because I think it gives students a chance to say, whew, I'm really uncomfortable here. <laughs> I, sometimes they just need a little bit of breathing room to be able to say, yeah, I'm uncomfortable and I feel like I need to have a little nervous laugh or something and not have somebody bite my head off about it. So Reader's Theater is just a nice way to do that. Um, we have 30 seconds. Does anyone have, if you've got questions or comments or um, tell us not to ever do this presentation again, you can come down to the front at the end. But we appreciate your time. This is something we really get passionate about and um, hopefully in another three years we'll have another 10. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. It'd be awesome to have another 10. I've already had a couple to add. Okay. But. Anyway, so thanks guys. We're finished. Thanks.